ce soir. The 1911 Salon des Etapada, like the Salon d'Automne of the same year and the Section d'Or in October 1912, ushered in public recognition of the Cubist movement. Picasso and Brock, however, did not take part. Cubism was now a doctrine that could serve as a rallying point for the younger generation. Albert Gleises and Jean Metzinger thus noted that the two co-founders became Cubists as if by ricochet and that they watched the movement developing despite them. Only the pair's preoccupation with the geometrical and with simplification could form the basis for a school. Unlike numerous other European capitals, such as Berlin and Moscow, Paris witnessed the advent of a whole new generation of Cubists, while Picasso and Brock started working in an analytical way that their disciples and immediate followers were not in a position to fathom. If it is true that Cubism became not only a movement but also a model that allowed its exponents to express rejection of the old world order, a closer reading of the chronology of the fast-moving events on the art scene shows how, from 1909, the trail Cubism had blazed split into numerous, often contradictory, sidetracks. Today, for example, there can be no justifiable reason for assimilating the work of Robert and Sonia Delaunay after the simultaneous contrast to Orthodox Cubism. Similarly, the term is inapt when referring to the Section d'Or, the salon organized by the Duchamp brothers in 1912. For innovative minds, Cubism was never an end in itself, but more a pretext, marking the moment, at the dawn of the modern period, when it was possible to reflect on the finality of painting. For instance, a few years later, although he was himself a pioneer of Cubism as a system, Albert Gleises recognized that the idea, as it developed, had burst out of the flimsy envelope of the word Cubism. In 1919, the modernist poet Blaise Sandrar, an early ally of Fernand Léger as well as of Robert and Sonia Delaunay, remarked for his part, the day can already be foreseen when the term Cubism will as regards the history of contemporary painting, only serve as a name for the various investigations undertaken by certain painters between the years 1907 and 1914. After Léger, who exhibited at the 1909 Salon d'Automne, and Robert Delaunay, who like Léger had a predilection for cityscapes, Juan Gris' specific investigations aimed to lay bare not only the relationship between the object and oneself but also that between objects. However, the very definition of Cubism was becoming waylaid in the inventory of minor masters and marginal figures, who as often as not retained Cubism's system of spatial division solely. It is still more intriguing to note how from that time aside from the efforts of Apollinaire, who was committed body and soul to reconstitute the scattered remnants of Cubism proper all attempts to produce a linear history foundered. Continuations and ventures as diverse as those of the futurist Francis Pacabia and Marcel Duchamp, as well as simultaneous developments in Russia, such as Rayonism and, shortly afterward, Suprematism, and in Germany and the Netherlands in the footsteps of Mondrian, ran parallel to Picasso and Brox, who themselves remained wedded to the idea of confining their explorations to a more realist domain. One can only concur with critic Pierre Deix's assertion that, Cubism's enduring repercussions lay not so much in the formal continuation of the plastic and analytical models it inaugurated as in the fact that it became, in parallel with its evolution, both abstractions antechamber and the system from which other areas, from architecture and industrial aesthetics, from literature to the cinema, were to draw the sustenance from which to begin anew. The increasingly rapid circulation of novel ideas and, as a consequence, the elimination of the forms of the past came to an abrupt halt with the outbreak of war. 
the confrontation between the partisans of an impossible reconciliation with the notion of progress and the advocates of a revolt against the contemporary world remained in abeyance. Duchamp, for his part, had already sensed this in 1912, preferring to satirize the society of the machine rather than enthuse over modern life. <laughs>